Escape from Sodom. Get your hand off of me! Edith shrieked at Archangel Michael. Michael did not pay any attention to Edith. With an inhuman single-mindedness, Michael took the hands of Lot and his wife Edith and proceeded to walk them briskly out of the city of Sodom, under the darkly overcast sky. Archangel Gabriel was doing the same with Lot's youngest daughters. Madis, the older of the two, was on his right, and Attis, the youngest, on his left. Each girl was firmly in hand, unable to escape the iron grasp and unable to do anything but keep pace with the rapidly moving angel. Lot's two older daughters, standing beside their husbands, looked on in disbelief as the strange procession quickly moved away from the courtyard of Lot's house. "'Where are you going?' Shittis, the oldest, called out. "'We are leaving now,' Lot called back hastily. "'Sodom will be destroyed any minute.' "'I just need to gather a few more things and I will catch up with you,' Shittis promised, while her husband could be heard giggling in incomprehension. "'No!' Lot demanded. There is no time. Come with us right now, or you will be lost. Remember to bring my jeweled hairpin, Edith offered hopefully to her daughter. Shutis quickly ran back into the house and was out of earshot. We are going to destroy the entire plane, Gabriel explained in a neutral tone, keeping up the fast pace. Please, please wait for the rest of my family, Lot pleaded. It is too late. Gabriel stated with a firm finality. They are more interested in their material possessions than in their lives. What are you talking about? Edith asked angrily. They are coming right along, and the things they are bringing are important. You do not understand, woman. The sins of these cities are so great that God could not delay destroying them any longer. And destroy them we shall, utterly. Nothing shall remain of what you knew as Sodom. If it were not for the merit of your uncle Abraham, you too would now die in the city. They arrived outside the gates of the city. Michael and Gabriel simultaneously released their captives. Gabriel raised his hands to the sky. The dark clouds rumbled. Thunder and lightning cracked the thick air. The sky detonated as if the long foretold end of the world had arrived. The angry sky poured fiery stones and acidic rain. Lot and his family heard panic and screams from inside the city. A crescendo of shrieks forced Lot's daughters to cover their ears. An acrid smell of burning flesh filled the air. Michael spoke to Lot's family with a booming voice that resonated to the heavens. Flee for your lives. Do not look behind you or stop anywhere in all the plain. Flee to the mountain lest you be swept away. Michael raised his hand and a beam of light erupted from his fingertips. The light reached the side of the mountain. Rock and earth exploded, sending fragments in all directions. The mountain was shrouded by a cloud of debris. After moments, the dust settled. To their complete astonishment, Lot and his family saw the contours of a road. The road was the straightest and smoothest road they had ever seen. It led straight up the mountain to Abraham. Lot loved his uncle, but could never return to him again. In his uncle's shadow, he would always be lesser, the sinner, the bad one, repugnant, worthless. He would die before he returned to Abraham. No, he needed to escape elsewhere. Now. Lot fell to his knees and begged, Please, no, my lord. See, now your servant has found grace in your eyes, and your kindness which you did with me to save my life was great. But I cannot escape to the mountain, lest the evil attach itself to me, and I die. Behold, please, this city is near enough to escape. Lot pointed further up the plain. And it is small. Lot's voice started to break. I shall flee there. Is it not small? And I will live. Michael stood pensively for a moment, and then replied. Behold, I have granted you consideration even regarding this that I not overturn the city about which you have spoken. Hurry, flee there, for I cannot do a thing until you arrive there. Michael raised his hands towards the city that would be called Zoar. Light radiated from his hands and tore through the rolling fields of grass and pasture. On the uphill slope to Zoar, Michael had again created a road. Michael then vanished into thin air, while Gabriel continued to rain down fire and brimstone on Sodom. 
the heat behind them increased. Lot grabbed his daughters and yelled to Edis, Edis, let us go. Let us save at least these two children. The family walked briskly but mechanically up the hill through a thickening fog of ash. They were in shock, not understanding what was occurring. The girls were the first to start crying. They slowed down. Lot continued to pull them by the hand. Madis, Attis, let us go. We must keep on moving, and whatever you do, do not look back. The wails from Sodom were reaching a fevered pitch. The scent of fire and burned flesh was overwhelming. Then the screams quieted down. Finally, it was silent, ominously quiet. Edith cried quietly, tears flowing down her soot-covered face. She slowly repeated, My babies! My poor babies! She looked at Lot, walking in front of her with the two girls. Her anguish turned to confusion and then to anger. She lunged for Lot, knocking him to the ground. She punched him on the back with her fists. It is all your fault! Edith sobbed hysterically. My babies are dead! My jewels are gone! Why did you have to invite those beings in? You are always trying to be better than everyone else! Superior, you and your morality. You are filthy, lustful leech, just like everyone else. But look at what you have done. Look at what you have done. Madis and Attis quickly grabbed their mother from either side and gently lifted her off of Lot. Lot got back on his feet and looked at Edith tenderly. I am sorry, Edith, but it is not my fault. The Sodomites were so immoral that it was inevitable that they would be punished. I did what I could, but it was not enough. The chiefs of Sodom sneered and threatened me when I raised even a hint of kindness. Lot bowed his head. I am sorry for our children. They too would not listen. We tried. Sorry? Tried? Edith asked, mad with grief. You sniveling excuse of a man. I will go back and find them. Edith, Lot said very firmly, clasping her arm. We cannot go back. We cannot even look back or we will surely die. Instinctively, Madis and Attis positioned themselves behind their mother to prevent her from going backwards and to block her view if she turned. Edith abruptly ripped her arm out of Lot's grip. How dare you tell me what to do? My wealth is destroyed. My babies may be dead back home or they might be following us right now. And you are too cowardly to save them, to even turn around and check. I will go myself if I have to. Mother, no! Madis grabbed her mother from behind. Did you not hear the angel? Everyone is dead. I can feel the heat getting closer. If we do not continue, if we even look back, we will die. How can I go on? Edith was sobbing uncontrollably. My babies are dead. My husband is no husband. Where will we go? What about my house, my jewelry, and my friends? I must return. <laughs> Edith started to slip out of Mattis' embrace. Attis saw the movement, and she tried to grab her mother and block her view. But Edith was quicker. She turned around, now embraced on either side by her daughters, and took a full frontal look at the destruction of Sodom. She could not believe her eyes. The lush fields, the strong walls, the rich houses, the colorful courtyards, they were completely destroyed. The entire plain was blackened and distorted. Thick black smoke covered the entire sky. The only color in the world was the red of angry flames, consuming the dead remains of a once proud civilization. Then she understood. She understood that Sodom was completely evil. She understood that she was an active participant, and she knew that she too deserved to die. Salty tears poured freely down her face, pooling around her feet. The tingling started in her toes. They became numb. The feeling spread quickly up her legs. Edith gasped in shock and looked down at her legs. Mattis and Attis jumped back and stared in disbelief at what seemed like salt replacing their mother's skin. Edith could taste the salt in her mouth as the metamorphosis worked its way up her torso. Edith's feeling of horror was mirrored on the faces of her daughters. Mother! 
they cried in unison, grabbing her again, as if by embracing her they could stop the process. Edith had time for only three words before the transformation was complete. I am sorry, she whispered with her last tears. And then she was a pillar of salt.